Income tax 2023-2024. Self-employment tax, otherwise known as SE tax. Who must pay self-employment tax? Part number one. Get ready and some coffee because the only thing certain about life is death and taxes. And the only thing certain about death is the government will desecrate your remains conducting a cold corpse cavity search, making sure you don't take any of that coin to the grave instead of the government coffers. Okay, maybe I took that a little too far. Uh, anyway, self, self-employment, self-employment tax. Most of this is first a word from our sponsor. Yeah, actually, we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But, but that's okay, whatever. Because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our Accounting Rocks product line. If you're not crunching cords using Excel, you're doing it wrong. A must-have product. Because the fact, as everyone knows, of accounting being one of the highest forms of artistic expression means accountants have a requirement, the obligation, a duty to share the tools necessary to properly channel the creative muse. And the muse, she rarely speaks more clearly than through the beautiful symmetry of spreadsheets. So get the shirt, because the creative muse, she could use a new pair of shoes. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. Information can be found in publication 946, how to depreciate property, section 179, deduction, special depreciation allowance, makers, listed property, and more tax year 2023, which you can find on the IRS website at irs.gov, irs.gov. Remember, in the first half of the income tax formula, basically a funny income statement. Most income statements having income minus expenses resulting in net income. Here, having income minus deductions resulting in taxable income. Noting that the Schedule C rolls into line one income of the formula. The Schedule C itself, however, also an income statement having business income minus business expenses, which you could call business deductions resulting in, in essence, net business income, which is what rolls from the Schedule C to line one income of the formula. This formula outlining the calculation on the form 1040 of which we see the first page here, Schedule C ultimately rolling into line number eight, additional income from Schedule one. This is the Schedule one, additional income and adjustments to income, part number one, additional income, the Schedule C, it rolls into line three, business income or loss. This is the Schedule C, profit or loss from business, having that income statement format, income minus expenses. We're looking now at the self-employment tax, noting the self-employment tax can be thought of as similar to the payroll taxes if you were a W-2 employee. In other words, the Social Security and Medicare. Remember that with the Schedule C, we don't typically pay ourselves W-2 income, although the IRS thinks of us as, in essence, kind of like an employee of the business. Or in other words, the IRS does want to collect self-employment tax or Social Security and Medicare. So instead of issuing a W-2, which gets quite complicated, we could just have this simple Schedule C and the net income from the Schedule C is on the thing that on which we will calculate the self-employment tax, which is the Social Security and Medicare, as well as calculate the federal income taxes. That means and is why whenever we add a Schedule C to a Form 1040 type of business, it adds a substantial amount of complication in part because when we have W-2 income, we usually don't have to worry much about Social Security and Medicare because it was handled by the employer and is just being reported on the W-2, not having much impact on the calculation of the federal income tax for the Form 1040. But if we have income subject to self-employment, most commonly the Schedule C, 
then we have to deal not only with the federal income tax as we do our data input for the form 1040 we also have to deal with the self-employment tax that's what we're diving into here so who must pay self-employment tax generally you must pay self-employment tax and file schedule se form 1040 if your net earnings from self-employment was 400 dollars or more that's income minus expenses obviously if you had a loss for the the schedule c as we talked about in a prior section or course then you're not going to have any self-employment tax and if you have only 400 dollars then you're still not going to have any self-employment tax but as your income goes up then you're going to be subject to self-employment tax if you're reporting that on the schedule c as opposed to having say w-2 income at which point you still had uh tax but it was withheld by the employer for social security and medicare if you have passive income such as stocks and bonds then it's likely you'll be subject to federal income taxes but not the self-employment uh tax uh social security and medicare so you schedule se to figure net earnings from self-employment sole proprietor and independent contractor so if you are self-employed as a sole proprietor or independent contractor you generally use schedule c form 1040 to figure your earnings subject to the se tax so the sole proprietor is generally the kind of business that you will just be if you start earning uh, earning money so in other words uh, if you just start a hot dog stand or something like that and you just start selling hot dogs even if it was an illegal business <laughs> the irs is still going to want their taxes on it you're basically going to be a sole proprietorship the irs is going to want a schedule c for it and to collect their portion federal income taxes as well as generally the self uh, employment tax the social security and medicare now be careful because a lot of like lawyers and and whatnot and cpas might be in businesses of setting up different types of entities and one of the one of the the draws of different types of entities might be to try to lower taxes such as the self-employment uh, tax and it, it just gets confusing when you, when you start thinking about the different entities and how the self-employment tax is going to be basically calculated right so with the schedule c you take the net income it's going to be subject to self-employment tax what if you had a c corporation well if you had a c corporation you would have a separate legal entity which is owned then by the shareholders and any employment of the business including like the ceo the top level are going to be subject to w-2 income and therefore they're going to pay self-employment tax in a similar way as any w-2 payer it's going to be withheld by the employer and the employer is also going to have to pay their portion of the self-employment tax the problem with a c corporation for small businesses is that it's difficult to take money out because it's going to be a draw and draws could be subject to taxes i'm sorry it's going to be a dividend and dividends will be subject to taxes so you have double taxation then there's an s corporation which is trying to get the best of both worlds of a corporation and a sole proprietorship and with that situation you could you could say well if you had an s corporation it's still going to flow through the income to your form 1040 but if you didn't have any income going to yourself it might not be subject then to the self-employment tax but obviously the irs is going to say hey what we really would like you to do is say all of your income that you made from the s corporation if you're an active participant of the s corporation should be issued to you in the form of a w-2 so you actually add a level of complexity the irs would basically say we still want you to pay the self-employment tax social security and medicare but we want you to do it by putting yourself on the payroll which means if you're the only employee of the business you have to deal with payroll now which is a significant complication and then pay yourself income the irs would argue income equal to the net income of the business so that you're paying self-employment tax kind of similar to what you would pay as a sole proprietor but you're paying it in the form of your your withholdings and then the co company is going to pay half of it as well in the payroll taxes so it gets kind of confusing that's matched up between the two so that s corporation just be careful with that structure of it because it 
you know, there could be you could pay yourself something other than all of the net earnings of the business. Some of that income not being subject to to possibly self-employment tax, which would be uh, subject to self-employment tax on a Schedule C. But it gets kind of messy and somewhat complicated. So just be careful with that. And then with a partnership situation, then now you have a partnership which could still have flow through and that might be an LLC situation. The question there being, do we tax it with a W-2 at the level of the partnership or rather do we flow through from the partnership to the form 1040 once again calculating on a schedule SE self-employment tax rather than on, on a W-2 paying yourself W-2 income. All right, just to touch on that, uh, SE tax rates, the 2023 self-employment tax rates uh, on net earnings is 15.3. So that's 12.4 for Social Security uh, plus the, the uh, tax plus 2.9 for the Medicare. Now, this is also somewhat confusing because if you had W-2 income, then when you see it on your on your W-2, you'll see the withholdings for Social Security and Medicare. So if you made 100,000 W-2 income, you would typically have 0.062 withheld for Social Security, 6,200 and 100,000 Medicare is going to be uh, times uh, 0.0145. So, so here you're saying, well, wait a second, this is this is much higher, 12.4. Why is that? Because on your W-2 income, it's kind of like a matching situation. You pay half of it, and your employer pays half of it. So, so the total tax that is being paid would then be the 6.2 times 2. That's why it's the 12.4. And the, one point, uh, the, the 0.0145 times 2, that's where they're getting the, the 2.9. That also becomes confusing, again, when you try to compare different types of entities. Like if you were a sole proprietorship, you're paying, in essence, this 15.3. But if you're an S corporation, then you'd have to pay yourself. But if you were the only owner of an S corporation, you would be paying yourself W-2 income, withholding half of it, right? The, 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 the 6.2 and the 0.0145. And then you would also be paying as the corporation, the other half. So, so it becomes a little bit confusing to do the comparisons between what happens in a corporation, what happens for sole proprietorship because half is being paid by the employee, half by the employer. If you're the sole owner of the corporation, you are in essence playing the whole piece because you are the employee and the employer. That is implicitly, by the way, what the IRS is saying here. They're saying, we're not gonna force you to do a W-2 income because that's complicated. We know a lot of people might not even be able to do that. It would restrict people from making a hot dog stand because they don't want to deal with W-2 preparation. But we're going to treat you as though you are both the employee and the employer because we're taxing you on both the employee and employer portion of your net income. All right, maximum earnings subject to self-employment tax. So only the first 160,200 of your combined earnings, tips, and net earnings in 2023 is subject to any combination of the 12.4 Social Security part of self-employment tax, social security tax, or the tier one part of railroad retirement tax. So in other words, the part that is social security versus the part that is Medicare has a cap on it of 160,200. Over that amount, you're not paying any more social security. That often bothers people because you would think as people earn more money, you should the tax rate should go up. That's what a progressive tax system does. And in this case, you're going to stop at 160200 and then you don't pay any taxes beyond that. And the rationale for this, in part, is because we in America do not really understand or have an idea of what we want from Social Security. Do we want it to be a government-funded retirement program for everybody? Or do we want a safety net program to help those that weren't able to save for retirement? Now, due to the high rate of social security it looks like america is leaning towards having this government funded retirement plan which means that in a normal retirement plan the more money you put into it the more money you should get out at the point of retirement the retirement calculations that you're getting out of retirement 
are based on how much money you put into it but there's a limit on it so as you keep on putting more money into social security your benefits are going up at a lower and lower rate at, until some point where you're not getting any more benefit from putting more money in and therefore and that's kind of why you have a cap on it with the medicare side of things it's it's more like a safety net program which i think was more like the original intent of these programs in other words we live in a free country and we should be responsible, in essence, to save for our own retirement and not have the government take all of our, our money out of our wages, you would think, but then have a safety net program for people that aren't able to save for retirement, which means that the amount that they should be taking out of Social Security is much less, which is kind of what you see in Medicare. You see a much lower rate and it's there to take care of a safety net situation, not to turn the country into some kind of communist weird thing you know, where the government's taking care of everybody uh, and taking everyone's money kind of weird stuff happening. So in any case, we got to figure that out because the country's going, the social security is going bankrupt. Any case, all of your combined wages, tips and net earnings in 2023 are subject to any combination of the 2.9% Medicare part of the social security or self-employment tax, Medicare tax and Medicare part of railroad retirement. So there is no cap on Medicare because Medicare looks more like a normal kind of thing, a safety net, and therefore the higher your income, then you should pay at least the same rate and possibly a higher rate because it's a progressive tax. So if your wages and tips are subject to uh, either social security tax or the tier one part of railroad retirement packs or both, and total at least 160,200 do not pay the 12.4% social security part of the SE tax on any uh, of your net earnings. However, you must pay the 2.9 Medicare part of the social security tax. So in other words, now we have this cap, which seems pretty straightforward, but actually is a little bit confusing. And this j just want to point out that the progressive tax system, every time we add a new level of progressiveness to the tax system, it seems like it should be an easy thing to deal with, but the complications become they start to multiply because obviously this starts to get confusing to make projections about because I can't just use the flat rate anymore because I have this cap if we go over that cap and so on and so forth. All right, addition, and then we have another additional Medicare tax. So a 0.9% additional Medicare tax may apply to you if your net earnings from self-employment exceed a threshold amount based on your filing status. So now we've turned the, the Medicare portion of the tax into a progressive tax, meaning it's no longer completely flat, same rate, which is really easy to calculate. But if you go over a certain amount, then you know you have this 0.9% additional Medicare tax. So for more information, you can see self-employment tax uh, in chapter one and form 8959 and its instructions. Obviously tax software helps with these calculations but you need to know the, the general idea of self-employment tax so that you can explain it to people so that you can help them with comparisons so that you can deal with, with them when they do have like lawyers and whatnot telling them that if they just create an S corporation or something like that, then they'll save all this money and whatnot, which there could be some truth to, but it's, there's pros and cons to it in terms of complications. So we need to kind of look at it in a little bit more detail. Okay, so aliens. So generally, resident aliens must pay self-employment tax under the same rules that apply to U.S. citizens. Now, with aliens, it becomes a problem because oftentimes we, we want people possibly to be working here, uh, even if they're not citizens. However, our again, our our structure of the of the tax system becomes a problem because the whole point of the self-employment tax being so high. Uh, is that you're supposed to be getting a benefit from this now government funded retirement program. And if you're not a citizen, you don't qualify for the benefits upon retirement. And so now the question is, well, what about these people that don't qualify for the benefits and they're paying, they're paying in this large amount into, into the social security, right? That becomes kind of a complication. So non-resident aliens are not subject to self-employment tax unless an international social security agreement also known as a uh, totalization agreement in effect determines that they are covered under the u.s social security system so sometimes you can end up with this kind of weird situation where you, the, you know the non-resident aliens 
aren't subject to self to so to self-employment tax which the government would actually be would be arguing that that's a, a disincentive to them because they're not going to get the beautiful benefits that we're going to provide upon retirement but i think most u.s citizens would actually prefer not to be subject to self-employment tax keep their 12 point whatever percent right when they earn it and save for their own retirement especially given the fact that social security is basically bankrupt already and we have no real assurance that it's going to be around at retirement for people that are currently in their working years so again kind of weird situations that happen as we make the tax code more complex uh so however Red residents of U.S. Virgin Islands, Puerto Rico, Guam, the Commonwealth of uh, Northern Mariana Islands, and American Samoa are subject to self-employment tax as they are considered U.S. residents for the self-employment tax purposes. So, for dealing with aliens, you got to make sure that we're, you know, how how things are going to be structured depending on where the location is in the tax treaties which adds a level of complication and could also lead to an area of specialization for certain people to, to focus on your taxes on those areas. So for more information on aliens, you can see publication 519 U.S. Tax Guide for Aliens. So child employed by parent. So you're not subject to self-employment tax if you are under age 18 and you are working for your father or mother. So church employee. So if you work for a church or a qualified church controlled organization other than as a minister, member of the religious order or Christian science practitioner that elected an ex uh, exemption from social security and Medicare taxes, you are subject to the self-employment tax if you received $108.28. That number is hilariously small because they haven't changed the law and that's what happens. Uh, when it doesn't get adjusted for inflation, the tax code has all these numbers in it that are kind of small because they haven't been increased for inflation over time or more in wages from the church or organization. So for more information, you can see publication 517, Social Security and other information for members of the clergy and religious workers. So fishing crew members, we got to they, they always have those exceptions for those fishing crews. Another area of specialization or an area to watch out for if you're not specialized in the fishing crews. So if you are a member of the crew on a boat that catches fish or other aquatic life, your earnings are subject to self-employment tax if all the following conditions apply. You do not get any part uh, for the work except your share of the catch or a share of the proceeds from the sale of the catch unless the pay meets all the following conditions. The pay is not more than $100 per trip. The pay is received only if there is a minimum catch. The pay is solely for, adi for additional duties such as mate, engineer, or cook for which additional cash pay is traditional in the fishing industry. So you get a share of the catch or a share of the proceeds from the sale of the catch. Your share depends on the amount of the catch. So the boat's operating crew normally uh, numbers fewer than 10 individuals. An operating crew is considered as normally made up of fewer than 10 if the average size of the crew on trips made during the last four calendar quarters is fewer than 10. All right, Notary Republic. Fees you receive for services you perform as a Notary Republic are uh, reported on the Schedule C, but are not subject to the self-employment tax. So we have our exception here for an, the industry of the good old notary republic. See the instructions for Schedule SE Form 1040. State or local government employees. You are subject to self-employment tax if you are an employee of a state or local government are paid solely on a fee basis and your services are not covered under a federal state social security agreement. So foreign government or international organization employees. So whenever we're dealing with places outside of the United States, obviously we're going to end up with more complications because there could be tax implications in both areas. When we're looking at the social security, one of the issues is if we're paying into social security, it doesn't make sense really for people to pay into it. Again, if they're not going to be able to get a benefit from the social security, you would think because the idea 
is that we're thinking of it more of like a government funded uh, retirement plan for everybody, which I don't think is the right way to go. But that seems to be the way we're we're going. So you are subject to self-employment tax if both the following conditions are true. So you are a U.S. citizen employed in the United States, Puerto Rico, Guam, American Samoa, the Commonwealth of North Mariana Islands, or the U.S. Virgin Islands by a foreign government, a wholly owned agency of a foreign government, or an international organization. Your member is not required uh, to withhold Social Security and Medicare taxes from wages. U.S. citizen or resident alien residing abroad. U.S. citizen or resident alien living outside the United States. In most cases, you must pay the self-employment tax. And you would think that would be somewhat, that would kind of make sense, right? Because if you're outside the United States, but you're still a U.S. citizen, you would think you might still be able as a U.S. citizen to get the benefits upon retirement of Social Security and therefore would have to be subject to, you know, the self-employment tax. So foreign earnings from self-employment can't be reduced by your foreign earned income exclusion when computing self-employment tax. Once again, this becomes kind of an area of specialization. If you're dealing with clients that have uh, earnings abroad, they're U.S. citizen or resident aliens residing abroad. So exception, the United States has social security agreements with many countries to eliminate double taxation un- under two social security systems. So in other words, clearly we're going to have an issue if they're subject to taxes in the other country as well as U.S. taxes. So treaties typically need to be made amongst the countries, which can differ depending on the country we're in to accommodate who's going to get what with regards to your money. So under these agreements, you must generally only pay Social Security and Medicare taxes to the country in which you live. So the country to which you must pay the tax will issue a certificate that serves as proof of exemption from Social Security tax in the other country. For more information, see the instructions for Schedule SE Form 1040. More than one business. What if we've got multiple Schedule Cs because we got multiple business. We're busy people doing busy multiple businesses. So if you have earnings subject to self-employment taxes from more than one trade, business, or profession, you must combine the net profit or loss from each to determine your total earnings subject to self-employment tax. So clearly, just as you would expect, you'd have multiple Schedule Cs, possibly you're going to be adding them together to help to determine what your ter- total self-employment tax calculation is going to be, which can get a little confusing again, especially if you go over the cap of the self-employment uh, uh, tax. So a loss from one business reduces your, your profit from another business, which is nice because then you, you would like to take the loss that you have on one business against the other business to lower the amount that's going to be subject to the self-employment tax calculation. Community property income. If any uh, of the income from a trade or business other than a partnership is community property income under state law, it is included in the earnings subject to self-employment tax of the spouse carrying on the uh, trade or business. So this becomes an issue when we have a married couple, for example, because because then the question is usually if you're if you're single and then you become married you have become one entity and body sold and for taxes but when we think about the social security it's still going to be applied to who has the social security number so normally the state is what determines whether it be a community property state or not and usually if it's a community property state it's kind of like the idea would be that you'd be splitting everything kind of evenly as you know one entity. And so then questions come up with regards to, again, who the self, who the income for the sole proprietor business is going to be applied to in terms of their social security number. The self-employment tax paid as a whole will in essence be the same, but uh, it will affect the benefits that people will be getting upon retirement because those benefits are not based on married couples but rather based on the social security number so gain or loss 
So do not include in earnings subject to, to, so, to social uh, self-employment tax, uh, a gain or loss from the disposition of property that is neither stock in trade nor held primarily for sale to customers. It does not matter whether the disposition is a sale, an exchange, or an involuntary conversion. Lost income payments. So if you are self-employed and reduce or stop your business activities, any payments you receive from insurance or other sources for lost business income is included in earnings subject to self-employment. So if you are not working when you receive the payment, it still relates to your business and is included in earnings subject to self-employment even though your business is temporarily inactive. So in other words, you had a business, you stopped the business for a while or possibly even permanently, but you still got some payments related to the business. What you would like to do at that time is say, hey, look, I don't have a business anymore. I closed it. I would like to just record this as other income possibly. Why would I would rather do that? Because then I would be subject to federal income taxes, but not Social Security and Medicare. And, and again, the government would probably say, don't you want to pay into Social Security and Medicare? Because then you're going to get more benefits upon retirement. It's like, no, I don't. I if I had a choice, I wouldn't be paying. I wouldn't be paying into it. It's ridiculous. But so that's what you'd rather do. But they're going to say, no, we're going to force you to pay it in to Social Security and Medicare because it's still subject to your business, even though your business is basically closed at the point in time you received it. So figuring earnings subject to self-employment tax methods figuring for net income. So there are there are three ways to figure the earnings from self-employment. So the regular method, you've got the non-farm optional method, you've got the farm optional method. So you must use the regular method to the extent you do not use one uh, or both of the optional methods. So why use an optional method? So you may want to use the optional methods discussed later when you have a loss or a small net profit and any of the following applies. You want to receive credit for social security benefits. You uh, incurred uh, child or dependent care expenses for which you could claim a credit. So the credits kind of complicate things sometimes. An optional method may increase your earned income, which could increase your credit. In other words, you end up with these weird situations where an earned income credit, which we'll talk about in a future course or section, could actually go up if you had more earned income, right? And, and so you end up actually wanting more income where typically you want less income for taxes. So uh, you are entitled to the earned income credit. An optional method may increase your earned income, which could increase your credit. You are entitled to the additional child tax credit. An optional method may increase your earned income, which inc could increase your credit. So effects of using an optional method, using an optional method could increase your self-employment tax, which is usually bad. Paying more self-employment could result in your getting higher benefits when you retire. So the general idea is that we probably want the general method, which will likely result in lower taxes, but sometimes we might want to have higher taxes, possibly because other credits are dependent upon our self-employment income, like the earned income credit, or because we're actually trying to pay more into uh, the self-employment. So if, for example, you had a long time before you're going to retire, then I would say that you probably are of the mindset that you want to pay as little into self-employment uh, as you can, particularly given the fact that the, the the social security seems to be somewhat bankrupt. So either something's going to change in the law or we're going to hit the wall and everything's going to fall apart. Either way, there's no guarantee if you're a long way away from retirement that you're going to get that money in benefits at retirement. It's going to look a lot different. Uh, it's going to look a lot different at some point, right? It's going to hit the wall at some time. But if you're close to retirement, and you're saying, hey, look, if I could pay a little bit more into Social Security because I'd have a few years that have a higher payment into it, then the amount of check that I'm going to get at the point of retirement could go up significantly. You can imagine it might be worth paying more into Social Security if you can and then get the higher benefits based on that. All right. Using the optional method, 
may also increase your AGI, adjusted gross income, due to the deduction, uh, deduction for one half of self-employment tax on Form 1040 or 1040SR, which may affect your eligibility for credits, deductions, or other items that are subject to the AGI uh, limit. Figure your AGI with and without using the optional methods to see if the optional method will benefit you. So if you use either or both optional methods, you must figure and pay the self-employment tax due under these methods, even if you would have had a smaller tax or no tax using the regular method. The optional methods may be used uh, only to figure your self-employment tax, to figure your income tax, include your actual earnings in gross income. So regular method. To figure your earnings using the regular method, multiply your self-employment earnings by 92.35%. That's 0.9235. We'll see this in the worksheet when we look at our example problem. For your net earnings figured using the regular method, see line 4A of Schedule SE Form 1040. Net earnings uh, figured using the regular method are also called uh, actual net earnings. So we'll take a look at that more again once we get to our practice problem uh, in software.